The views and opinions expressed by contributors on the Spoon River Gothic podcast are their own and do not necessarily reflect the position of the host. Material heard on the Spoon River Gothic podcast is intended for adult listeners. This podcast deals with mature topics that may not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. This is Spoon River Gothic, narrative of a double homicide. Hello, no one is available to take your call. Please leave a message after the tone. In this day and age, almost anyone can be found online because your private information is no longer private. In today's world, the risk of being tracked online is a significant concern. Anyone, like a coworker, a new online date, or even a stranger can pose a threat if they gain access to your personal information. Your personal information is already exposed whether you like it or not. In fact, the average person, including you, will have over 2,400 pieces of personal information exposed online over the next two years. Your online reputation is everything, and 40% of information data brokers have on people is inaccurate. This could mean lost job opportunities, higher insurance premiums, or even wrongful arrest. And after hearing our podcast, we all know this could lead to something much darker. And everyone knows that is not a risk you should be willing to take. But did you know there is a legit way to make your personal data yours again? Spooner for Gothic has partnered with number one personal data removal service, Delete Me. Since 2011, Delete Me has made it quick, easy, and safe for listeners like you to remove your personal data online. But how does Delete Me work? Well, it's quick and easy. You just sign up at join deletemecom slash spoon river and submit your personal information for removal from search engines. Next, the removal process begins as Delete Me experts find and remove your personal information, and you will then receive a detailed Delete Me report within seven days. And that's not it. Delete Me experts will continue to scan and delete any detected personal information every three months throughout the year. Since 2011, Delete Me has saved users over 54 years. That's 20,000 hours of required effort to remove personal information from online sources. Delete Me has developed the most comprehensive, thorough, and transparent information removal product on the market. And that is why PCMag.com named Delete Me Excellent, the most outstanding product in its category. With an average rating of 4.7 out of 5 stars, Delete Me has over 800 plus reviews and an A-plus rating by the Better Business Bureau. So know that you can trust this industry leader in online personal data removal. Also, the Delete Me team is always there to help you and prides itself on its outstanding customer service and a 100% satisfaction guarantee. The Delete Me team is not happy if you're not happy. Your privacy is their business. So join Delete Me now now, risk-free at joindeleteme.com slash spoon river because no one wants to be a victim or a suspect. So get protected before it's too late. And next time that case hits too close to home, you will not find yourself asking that strange person on the other end of the line, how did you find my number? Again, that's joindeleteme.com slash spoon river.
was 13 days into the new year, 1993, Canton, Illinois, in the heart of the Spoon River Valley. What remained of the holiday lights twinkled from ice-encrusted eaves? A bank trust officer named David Haynes had arrived early in the morning to Secretary's apartment in an old Victorian home to check on her, as she had yet to arrive for work with the ATM drop. David backed his mustard yellow Toyota pickup into Donna's icy drive at about 9.15 a.m. Cleaning lady Cindy Nelfs was putting her supplies away in her hatchback, and she watched the dark-haired mustache man until she drove off as he climbed out of his truck. He then walked through the snow to the home's south side facing porch where he banged on the door, but there was no response. He ran around the house to the north side apartment and knocked on that neighbor's door to ask Pauline Newcomb, owner of the property, if he could use her phone to call the police, and that is when he heard a tapping on Donna's side of the wall. He panicked, ran back to Donna's side of the home and pulled an air conditioner out of the kitchen window when two columns of smoke billowed into the windy sky. He then broke a window in Donna's front door and forced his way in, and amongst the smoke and crackling, that's when he saw it, the bright red dome of an inferno burning across the room, and the fierce heat pushed him back out of the house as he shouted her name. Donna, Donna, Donna. Engines from the Canton Fire Department rolled up in five minutes. Firefighters contained the blaze and made their way to the main bedroom. It had been completely scorched. The ceiling was black with soot and ash, and there was fear that the ceiling joist would collapse into the room any minute. On a shared sofa bed, investigators saw two bodies. The woman's body was lying down towards the end of the bed, beside a broken whiskey bottle. Her legs drawn up, but if she had been straight, her legs would have been off the bed. Her arms were close to her sides, and her hands were charred. The small girl was lying on her back, with the wooden chair covering her head and shoulders, just to the woman's left, and both were in the nude. Outside, David looked at the smoking home and told a cop, if Don and Justine are in that room, they are surely dead. A man named John Tompkins, who had been busy grinding feed on his father's farm, heard the grim news. There had been an accident, and the coroner had been called. John fainted to the ground, as he knew immediately his 30-year-old wife and 3-year-old daughter were both dead. Word quickly spread around the community that a tragedy had occurred in the heart of town, and that the friendly lady from the bank and the heartthrob of a waitress at the Elks and her daughter were gone. It was all so heartbreaking, so shocking, and so unfair. But despite the rumors and gossip, they didn't know the half of it. Season 1 had brought you this story about titles in a virtuous name, about the power of revenge and greed, about lust and sex, dominance and desire, and finally, but ultimately, this was a story about murder. I'm Corey Zimmerman, and this is Narrative of a Double Homicide, a Spoon River Gothic podcast. Season Finale, Part 1, Slugbug. As firefighters hosed down what remained of Donna Tompkins' apartment, her boss, David Haynes, was left standing on the frozen lawn outside, gradually pushed back by the officers taping off the scene. He told police he had discovered the fire and initially thought it might be a gas leak, as the meter was spinning and whining out of control. But later, David blamed a possible booby trap set off by the answering machine when he called, or that he may have accidentally kicked over a container of accelerant as he entered the front door almost as though he was blaming himself for not being more cautious. As for the cause of death, that seemed obvious, but there was one odd thing about that fire theory. There was no soot found in either of their lungs, and the coroner found the cause of death undetermined. A defense witness would later have a theory, an unusual event that occurs when you have a high instant heat, like the heat of a flash fire unleashed by a gas leak, ignited by a spark. Donna and Justine's throats could have closed up and there would have not been any soot in their lungs, an explanation as to the cause. Donna and Justine's deaths were initially determined to be an accident. However, 
what would follow in the coming days was the belief that the two had most likely died before the fire. In other words, a murder was on the loose. And in the name of revenge and justice, a community, investigators, and a state's attorney, the notion would be challenged. You cannot let moral outrage substitute for evidence. And what would follow in the subsequent weeks, months, and years will become more complex and more challenging than anyone could believe. Almost as soon as the fire went out, a task force composed of the Canton Police Department, the Illinois State Police, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and the State Fire Marshal's Office, all headed up by the lead detective on the case, CPD Sergeant David Ayers, had all assembled at the easel to paint a profile of the killer. But first, officers did what they almost always do in a case such as this, and rightfully so. They spoke with immediate family. Loved ones, co-workers, friends, lovers, and of course, the spouse. That led investigators to Donna's estranged husband, John Tompkins. Then to her boss at the bank, the man who discovered the fire, David Haynes. And to an ex-lover, Terry Haynes, and the boyfriend at the time of the fire, Rod Franciscovich. As it would turn out, each and every one of these men in her life would find themselves on the suspect list, and for good reason with motives such as revenge, greed, lust, and love. Nevertheless, no other person like the original prime suspect, Trust Officer Haynes, had yet caught her attention to that same allure. With his odd behaviors and twist and turning stories, accounts utterly unbelievable, like that in which he had stood in the doorway, two feet inside amongst the fire, which investigators called a hot, fast, and intense blaze, in which would have breathed a backdraft which would also have consumed Mr. Haynes' life on this earth. But David's allure to police would only last so long until they heard of a shaggy-haired local furniture delivery man who had recently sold Donna a sofa bed. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the very one in which she and her daughter's bodies had been discovered upon. But this man named Donald Bull, whom police knew simply as Donnie, not in any way, shape, or form was he a stranger to the jail cell, as he had a bad history with women in his life and a record to prove it. And due to this past record of violence, it was no wonder police found him such a compelling suspect. And when his DNA was found within Donald Tompkins, Donnie became ripe for the picking, a man ideal to stand trial and answer for that growing list of mysteries. And it suddenly all made so much sense, not only to investigators but to the media, and thus the community at large. However, a mistake was made when painting this profile of Donnie, just as they had the other three men in Donna's life. The portrait was rendered backward, beginning with the face of the proposed culprit and then rendering in the scene of the murderous misdeed. So ladies and gentlemen, after 30 long years, the time has finally come to do this right. And not through inductive reasoning follow a proposed theory back to the origin of the blaze, not to shape the evidence or lack thereof to fit the suspect, but the opposite. But instead, through deductive reasoning, to analyze the scene and the crime, and that of the victim, and thus, let it point to the man, or yes, even the woman, who most likely struck the match. So let us begin with the question, who killed mother and daughter? This was a haunting question that hung over the small town of Canton, Illinois, on those chilly days following the January 13th fire, and among many others, it obsessed Detective Dave Ayers of the Canton Police Department. It obsessed Ed Danner, the state's attorney for Fulton County. And next I shall state a handful of simple facts. On the evening of January 12, 1993, Donna Tompkins sat on the phone with her boyfriend, Rod Franciscovich, after a short nap with her three-year-old Justine. While she sipped on an apple cider and schnapps, the two chatted and joked about a TV show they enjoyed watching together, which had flickered on Donna's screen, Rin and Stimpy. Rod and his roommate Scott Roop had recently helped Donna move into her new apartment at 365 South 1st Avenue. It was a two-story, grade-white, wooden-sided Victorian home dating back to the year 1900. The home sat on a tree-lined street, but Donna's small front porch and door, flanked by two columns, faced a set of old rusty tracks to the south, which headed for the looming International Harvester factory, which sat abandoned just two blocks to the east. Donna had spent the last few weeks setting up her new apartment for her and her daughter, getting the place in a livable shape, 
and Donna moved in and arranged old furniture she had taken off the farm, along with that used sofa bed she had purchased off a friend of a friend, a furniture delivery man named Donnie Bull, and it was rumored a quiet and forbidden romance had ignited between the two. The apartment which she had found through her close friend and boss at the bank, Trust Officer David Haynes, who managed the trust for the property, represented an exciting new beginning for Donna, who had recently moved off the farm and away from her estranged husband John, whom she believed had grown too abusive toward her, over money, family, having future children, and country life, which Donna, being an East Coast transplant, was slow to grow accustomed to. And John himself had grown accustomed to calling Donna an Eastern snob, so Donna decided it was time to pack up and leave, taking her daughter Justine along. They moved to the nearby town of Canton, and embracing her new life, she began to date. At the time of her death, Donna had been dating Rod Franciscovich, officially since around move-in day, back on November 1st. Though a recently divorced Rod wanted to make a real commitment to Donna, but her divorce from John, not yet official, was grueling and ongoing, and she wanted to take things slow. Indeed, just as she had told John, she told Rod she was not ready to have another baby, if ever, at all. While Donna was working at the National Bank of Canton, she took on a side job at the Elks Lodge for some extra cash and tucked it secretly away. She even took classes at the local community college, Spoon River College, where she studied finance at night. Donna was seeking a raise, stashing that cash away and was finally beginning to see her future as bright and hopefully the one her father so adamantly preferred for her. A great job, a remarkable man, an existence that was bragworthy. A life for his daughter he could finally be proud of. That last couple years of enduring that grueling divorce, Donna had undoubtedly moved on romantically. And after a few understandable rebound flings, and a failed relationship with a possessive and jealous man named Terry Haynes, who reminded her too much of John, Donna finally found who she believed to be an overall good guy. And this nice man was Rod. In fact, Rod had actually seen her first during Mass at St. Mary's Catholic Church, and upon discovering the pretty lady had shared his religious faith, running into her again at the bank, he decided to give it a shot, and asked her out on a date. Donna Tompkins was born Donna Jean Amicucci, the embodiment of an Italian-American girl, a back east girl, modern, and more worldly than most in this small central Illinois town, where many spent their final days in the same community in which they were born. Donna was tall and thin, but had a knockout figure, and with wavy dark hair and a pair of wide brown eyes that would lighten up any room, she attracted the attention of every man when she entered that room. The new girl in town, she had been the ideal for men, exotic and easy on the eyes, magnetic, which made her the envy of women and the topic of gossip, which sometimes turned rather harsh, especially amongst the older ladies whom she worked with at the bank who thought she showed too much leg, embraced the idea of the woman of the new millennium, possibly a bit too sincere. But nearly everyone remembers her as warm, generous, thought Donna was kind, an upstanding citizen, classy, and very professional. Her closest friends whom she could count on one hand, however, knew her in a different light. In fact, a light which illuminated another life for Donna than that one which she showed to the public a life which her friends would go on to call a double life indeed. And though Donna was surely more worldly than that community in which she had immersed herself within, she was seen by her confidants as relatively naive, too trusting, and wide open like a book. In her private life, Donna liked sex, drinking bourbon and puffing on cigarettes, facts which would not only go on to surprise her family and father, who was proud his daughter abstained from vices of any kind. A good girl with a good Catholic upbringing, which had followed her into adulthood, or so he believed. And even Donna's estranged husband was taken aback, a man who thought he knew his wife as well as anyone possibly could. Though the rumor mill whispered of the ups and downs and the men in and out of her life, Donna had fallen by Rod's kind-heartedness, though not the man her father dreamed of for his little girl, as he feared Rod might muddy the waters. However, Donna's close friends were beginning to believe Donna might have finally found that perfect partner. After getting off the phone with Rod that night, Rod went back to sharing a screwdriver in his kitchen with his roommate Scott and his brother Anthony, and Donna went back to what was indeed to be a restful evening before she would wake up early to pick up the cash drop at the Chestnut Street ATM on her way back to the bank. 
but intention is well little more than projection, and life and thus death often is made other plans. The question, what happened between that time Donna got off the phone with Rod and her untimely death marks where the very mystery begins. And as we all know, at some point during that night, she had flicked on the porch light, but when and for whom? Wednesday morning, as David Haynes dropped his two children off at the sitter and arrived at the bank, he discovered that a dozen or so concerned co-workers were worried and already deep in theory as to why Donna had not shown up with the ATM drop that morning. Had she gotten fed up with the small town the same way she had gotten fed up with the farm and hightailed it out of town with the loot, imaginations the like of detective shows flickering across their mind? One thing was for sure, as David had been told Donna did not arrive yet, he was told he might consider calling her at home, and he picked up his line. He gave Donna a call, but after four rings, he only received the machine, which sounded slow and distorted. David then ran upstairs and asked his boss, board of directors chairman, Max Scott, if he should run over to her house and check on her. Sure, said Max, shrugging David off, not entirely in the loop on the matter. David arrived at Donna's at about 9.15, and as cleaning lady Cindy Nouse packed her supplies in her hatchback, David backed all the way into the driveway. It had been a cold night, and everything was covered in ice, as a winter storm had arrived, leaving the streets and branches coated in ice. David buttoned up his expensive wool coat his wife Sarah had gifted him for Christmas, and he went to knock on the door. Donna didn't answer, though he saw the red Bonneville parked in her garage, with Justine's car seat in the back. The porch light was on, and that was strange. He opened the screen door and knocked hard on Donna's door, which had a large sheet of glass framed by thick wood. He checked the door and felt that it was solid and securely locked. And when no one answered, David ran over to Pauline Newcomb's apartment in that same building next door, as I had mentioned. He first asked her for a possible key, and then a phone book and a phone. Utterly concerned about his secretary, David called the police to insist on a welfare check and that is what he heard what sounded like a cane tapping on Donna's side of the wall. Something is wrong, the dispatcher heard him say away from the phone. And what followed by now, ladies and gentlemen, you are all too aware of. Next, David's boss, Max Scott, had showed up on the scene after he himself had tried giving Donna a call, but no one picked up, not even the machine. He had told the officer who had just pulled up out front to call the fire department, as they could hear David shouting, shattering glass from the windows he had broke out in the back, tempting to get inside, as he later stated, If I could have just gotten to them, I would have done anything to get to them. As firefighters arrived, neighbors spilled out onto their icy porches with steaming cups of coffee in hand, and one upstairs neighbor, Linda Huggins, called for her cat and came scurrying down the stairs and out onto the lawn in utter shock to see her home ablaze. While another, Jim Slanikin, awoke on his couch in a smoke-filled room, grabbed his jeans, coat, and shoes, and ran down the back stairs, only to see and hear David wildly breaking out those windows in the back of the house. Confused, Jim grabbed a shovel out of the garage and broke two out on his own. And as dark smoke rolled out, oddly enough, David scolded him for fueling the fire. Later that day, as already mentioned, out on the farm grinding feed, John would collapse in grief at the news. When investigators would eventually arrive on the farm, John not only barraged the investigators with questions, such as when the bodies were found, then stating they would have had to have died between 6.15 and 9.15 in the morning, and he asked if they had still been in sleeping position, and stated he had hoped so, because then they would have never felt the burning flesh or fight. He hoped their lives were taken as tranquil as possible, saying he thought maybe that smoke or carbon monoxide got them. John then let slip through his grief when the subject changed from their troubled relationship to the life insurance that his lawyer was looking into a $10,000 policy he had on Justine. But when the last premium came last month for Donna, he took it to her and she couldn't come up with the money, adding, well that's $25,000 down the chute. And back at the station, as David claimed he wasn't sure if he had a key to Donna's apartment, a key which would allow him access to the house, and he outrageously claimed he might have set off some kind of booby trap when he called and got the machine, and thus starting the blaze which claimed the lives of two of his closest friends. 
and his word got around and made its way into reports that Terry Haynes had told Donna on yet another harassing phone call to Rod. God will tell you you belong to me. And by the time Rod sat down, the investigators may have thought, hey, finally, we might be able to check someone off the list. But out came a barrage of opposing dates, times, and changed stories that got the officers' heads turning and their eyes meeting from across the interview room. But it was when detectives discovered that Donna had recently bought a sofa bed from bad boy Donnie Bull that the investigation really heated up. The steam engine plowed forth on a railroad that would seemingly bypass each and every other suspect, despite a troubled divorce, supposed booby traps, psychotic threats, and a mass of changing stories. Despite the web of romantic affairs that involved many more than Donnie, affairs that would unearth only to be reburied out of sight and thus out of mind for the jury, a jury that would go on to reach a verdict that Donald R. Bull was guilty and thus sentenced to death. But I am getting ahead of myself here, ladies and gentlemen, so let's take a step back. This kind of horror wasn't supposed to happen in Fulton County. Certainly not in Canton. A quaint town in a quiet region, snug in the Illinois and Spoon River Valley, a little less than an hour's drive southwest of Peoria. And before long, a multi-agency task force reached city limits. Don and Justine bodies were not found to have suffered any gunshot wounds, nor knife stabbings blunt force trauma, poisoning, or life-threatening diseases of any kind. But what piqued the interest and fueled the investigation was that no soot was found within Donna and Justine's bright cherry red lungs. And though the official cause of death was noted as undetermined, all minds drifted to that exact same conclusion, that mother and child were both dead before the fire, from asphyxiation or strangulation. And though the two had been discovered in the nude, indicating rape, the autopsy would conclude no, sexual assault was not evident. However, traces of sperm had, in fact, been found in Donna's vaginal swabs alone. Fortunately, not the child. And as much of a focus as the murder scene was, a problem dogged the police right from the start. In one term, inductive reasoning, a method of drawing conclusions by going from the specific to the general. If used appropriately, sure, it can be incredibly powerful. However, if you use faulty or unrepresentative data or evidence, conclusions can certainly, more often than not, be flawed. Inductive reasoning relies on evidence and observation to reach a possible truth of the conclusion. We say possible truth because inductive conclusions are not sure, only probable. In other words, just because all dogs are born with four legs doesn't mean, doesn't mean there are no three-legged dogs in the world. Deductive reasoning, conversely, uses statements and premises that are certain by definition. Deductive reasoning is the opposite of inductive reasoning. Using deductive reasoning in decision-making involves identifying the problem or goal to be addressed, gathering evidence that supports or contradicts it, formulating a hypothesis or possible solution, deducting any implications of your theory, comparing the consequences to the collected evidence, and evaluating the strength and validity of your solution. This process can help you test the validity and the consistency of any assumptions, arguments, and solutions. Revising your hypothesis or solution is necessary if any errors, gaps, or contradictions are found. Step 1, ladies and gentlemen, identify the problem. This we have already done by asking, who killed mother and daughter? Now, here was the first mistake police had made. The determination that the two had been murdered by asphyxiation and or strangulation, an assumption made by the medical examiner, it was not a certain conclusion determined by factual evidence. To correct the first issue, we would need to take a step back to identify the actual first problem. By asking, first, the obvious. How did Donna and Justine die? Well, we already know the medical examiner's conclusion. Officially undetermined. So what does that leave us with, ladies and gentlemen? It leaves us with an unanswered question. One that we must answer through the usage of none other than deductive reasoning. So this leads us to step two. 
gathering evidence that supports or contradicts any and all theories as to how the victims had died. In other words, collect what you can from the crime scene. Found was a portion of a broken whiskey bottle, both under and on top of the bed. And it is known through the autopsy that Donna had died with a blood alcohol content of .056. She had even told Rod on the phone that she had not only been drinking schnapps and cider, but that she had purchased a large bottle of Southern Comfort whiskey. When testing was complete to detect any accelerants that may have been used to fuel the fire and absorbed into any fibers, whiskey had been found. As solid as the theory seems to state that whiskey was used to fuel the fire and thus the fire was set, there is still the potential that the bottle broke due to the blaze, and therefore whiskey was simply spilled. Who knows why portions of the bottle were on or under the bed, but this question must be answered from the top down, not the bottom up. We must derive our conclusions by letting physical evidence lead us. We should not let our ethereal thoughts, opinions, and theories shape the evidence to meet said theory. Okay, enough with the preaching. Where does evidence found at the scene point concerning the deaths? What final hypothesis do we allow to formulate? Only after removing any facts contradictory to initial theories and setting our biases aside. We'll compare what the evidence suggests and weigh the strengths and the weaknesses of each theory in which we consider. Basically, it comes down to two primary possibilities. Accident or murder. In this case, the theory of an accident was thrown out the window rather quickly. And within the realm of foul play, the investigation was restrained. So let's assume for now that the detectives and investigators were correct, regardless of their reasoning method. From their perspective, this is a simple case of murder, a whodunit. So, whodunit. On the surface, Donna was well liked and had no outright enemies, at least not any who would seemingly be capable of murder, certainly not the little old ladies at the bank who envied her. But according to the police, murdered she had been. So to find out who may have done it, let's reintroduce the importance of proper reasoning. How do we determine the direction in which to look for the culprit? First, we must ask, where is the compass? And the answer is that the compass is none other than the crime scene itself. The evidence found therein, and the victimology, that is to say, the study of the victim. You may be surprised to learn that we have already conducted the victimology. At the beginning, when I ran through those simple facts concerning Donna Tompkins' life, who she was, who was in her life, the state of her life, In other words, her state of being, and most importantly, those final days before her death. Starting with the scene, we faced several obstacles. All the people who had been at the crime scene trampling through, beginning with the man who discovered the fire, then the initial responders, firefighters, police, EMS, detectives, and most harmful to any source of evidence, water. Tons and tons of an ungodly amount of water. And why was water used? Because the scene was on fire. But why would a fire have been set to destroy the scene and thus the evidence? There was also the possibility that the fire had been set to stage the scene like an accident, like something other had happened other than murder. And this is where the initial crime scene photos would come in handy, as they would have frozen the scene in time before all the debris had been shoveled out, before the remaining ash had been washed out by the powerful fire hoses of the fire department, seeking to find the fire patterns on the floor, which photos of would have been equally invaluable not as valuable as those initial photos which captured the most accurate state in which the scene had been left despite the damage the water and crowd of people had already caused. Now to borrow the insightful ideas from the original Mindhunter himself, special agent of the criminal profiling unit of the FBI, John Douglas. In his own words, statistically speaking, it was most likely that after the first or second round of questioning, the investigators had already spoken to the killer. Thus, he was in the area, and possibly in the immediate vicinity, as it most likely was a close friend, a lover, a spouse, and people don't often travel long distances to kill random people in this manner. If the two had indeed been choked, then it was a crime of passion, which reaffirms the killer was close to Donna, a part of her everyday life. Also, If the killer got blood on him, he most certainly would have been able to go someplace close by to clean off or get rid of his bloody clothing. 
Our guy would have been comfortable in this area and in this situation, and he knew he wouldn't be disturbed, either because he knew Donna well, or he had been observing her habits. Since the police most likely had talked to him, he was cooperative with the investigation. That way he felt he could control the investigation. There's a chance he didn't go to Donna's house with the intention of killing her. The killing may have been an afterthought. If he planned it, and Donna was in fact sexually assaulted, he would have most likely brought along a murder and rape kit with him. Instead, we have a supposed manual strangulation, demonstrating a spontaneous act of anger or desperation in response to a rejection. Manipulation, domination, and control are the watchwords of any rapist. He may have gone over to the house offering some kind of help, even a gesture of friendship, or even a planned first or second date. Donna was known as the friendly type, and since she knew this man, she would have probably let him in, even late at night, reaffirmed by the idea, reaffirmed by the idea, that there was supposedly no sign of forced entry among the evidence gathered. What he wanted from Donna was sex, or some sort of relationship. When she resisted, or when he realized he was in over his head, he decided the only way to save himself was to kill her. Even at that point, he probably panicked and had second thoughts. There was whiskey on the floor and sofa bed. After he had strangled her, it is possible he had splashed whiskey on her face to try to revive her. After that didn't work, he may have felt he had to deal with the child and did the same to her, leading himself to have to deal, in turn, with two dead bodies. So he poured more whiskey on the sofa bed, and possibly fuel from a can in the garage, and set fire to make it look like an accident, that the two had died in a house fire. In other words, to draw attention away from what had actually happened. The burning of the bodies had a secondary significance as well. She had rejected him, now scorching her stripped naked body. He could degrade not only her, but her daughter as well. And as in many cases, the more an offender does at the scene, even if it's an attempt to throw the police off the scent, the more clues and behavioral evidence he gives detectives to work with. And now, ladies and gentlemen, you are no longer the jury. You are the detectives. So hold the magnifying glass to your eye. This was most likely the work of a sexually driven white man in his mid to late twenties. Though he may have burglarized and assaulted or raped before, this was not the work of someone who had experienced killing or a great deal of life experience in general. This is due to the fact that the staging of an accidental fire was poorly done and trying to cover up the crime scene by and in turn attracting as much attention as an early morning firehouse would, he had probably never done this before. However, it appears he did have an explosive, assaultive personality, so he could have committed earlier crimes. If he had ever been married, he was probably divorced or separated, or was having marital discord. Like so many would-be killers, he had a poor self-image, and with menial jobs, he had grown accustomed to living in exploitive and dependent relationships, which would most likely have been the case with this man. He may have come across as confident, but deep down, he felt highly inadequate. He was probably of average to low intelligence and may have not graduated high school. He performed unspectacularly in school, but was streetwise and could handle himself in a fight. He would be seen as macho and tough, and his use of fire and fuel suggests he may have grown up on a farm, or in the least had much experience with fire, either through lawn work or camping. It is possible that once the investigation was initiated, he had changed residences or jobs. And once the heat was off and he wouldn't create any suspicion, he may have left town. He would have also been turning very heavily to alcohol, drugs, or cigarettes to relieve the tension. In fact, alcohol could have played some role in the murder itself. This would have been a bold move for this guy. He may have been drinking beforehand, which would have lowered his inhibition. Though it is essential to state that he would not have been drunk, because he would not have been able to do so much to stage the scene, get rid of the evidence. He would have lost weight, been having difficulty sleeping, and possibly had troubles with his sex life, and one would find him becoming more and more nocturnal. If he had a regular job, he would have missed a lot of work as the investigation geared up. He would have changed his appearance as well. If he had a beard and long hair at the time of the killing, he would have shaved them. If he was clean shaven, he would have grown a beard. We are not looking for the preppy type here. He would have been naturally scruffy and unkept, and any attempt to keep himself orderly would have been an obvious sign of over control, and he would have found this both mentally and physically exhausting. He would have been following the police investigation closely in the media, and taking leads from them, 
If the chief of police or lead detective had publicly stated that there had been no new leads, that would have given him a mechanism to cope. He could have easily passed a polygraph, as many killers do. And ideally, the goal of the investigation would have been to shake him up. There can be a lot of stressors. He may have become more nervous every year around the holiday season and the anniversary of the killings. He may have even been out to visit her grave in Oak Knoll Memorial Park Cemetery in Sterling, Illinois. He may have left flowers or asked her directly for forgiveness. Ideally, the police should have announced a new and promising lead, something that would appear to get the case back on the front burner, to keep the ass pucker factor as intense as possible. The police should have mentioned that they have brought an FBI profiler into the case and that what he was saying fits in perfectly with the new evidence they've developed. However, I am still waiting to come across any indication an FBI profiler had actually been involved in this case, ladies and gentlemen. It could have been useful to mention a possible exhumation of the body. It would have been especially powerful, suggesting that new evidence could possibly result, and that it is what they had expected. In a sense, what they would have conveyed to the killer was that they were resurrecting Donna and Justine, bringing them back from the grave, bringing them back from the grave to bear witness to their own murders. This would have been tremendously stressful for the killer, and he may have sought to confide in family members and friends. Detectives should have stated publicly on camera that if it took 20 years, they were going to solve the case. The killer would have been concerned and inquisitive. He would have been asking lots of questions. He may have even called the police directly. During the funeral, everyone who showed up at the cemetery should have been videotaped or photographed because he may have been there. He most likely would have been a loner, isolating himself from whatever friends he had. This was the time to start listening to people in bars and places like that to see if anyone noticed any of the regulars displaying any markedly changed behaviors. He may have joined a church or taken up a new religion as a means to cope. And while attempting to put pressure on the killer, the police should have made a comment in the paper from one of the cops that sounds almost empathetic, saying they know what he is going through, and that he did not intend to kill Donna, and indeed not the little girl and that they understand he is carrying all this weight, guilt, and remorse on his shoulders. Now, ladies and gentlemen, to not serve injustice upon anyone who had met the spotlight, it would be our responsibility to attempt to thoroughly exclude anyone who does not deserve to be on that suspect list. Now that the question has been asked, the evidence gathered, a hypothetical profile has been assembled. We must address any fact of evidence that may either support or contradict any of these possible suspects. And only then, with who remains, may we formulate our final hypothesis as to who may be responsible for the killings, upon which we can evaluate the strength and validity of that suspect in determining the most likely culprit. To begin, for the sake of insight, we will perform a 30-question survey, a list of 30 profile traits which we have just covered, upon which we can compare each suspect to see which traits fit with whom and which don't. 1. The suspect had been interviewed and was cooperative with police. David Haynes, Terry Haynes, John Tompkins, Rod Franciscovich, and Donnie Bull had all been interviewed by police. But of the five, only Donnie was not fully cooperative, and it is worth mentioning that Rod had refused a polygraph for fear he was not in an adequate mental state to perform well, and had been advised by his lawyers not to do so. At this time of the investigation, this would have also made Rod the only suspect who had acquired an attorney. However, overall, Rod did participate willfully in every other way, including blood and DNA samples, which Donnie had refused. For this, Donnie alone will not receive a point for cooperation. Number 2. A white male in his mid to late 20s. Of the four suspects, only David Haynes was not in or near this age range. Number 3. The killer was most likely of average intelligence, got poor grades, and went no further than high school. David finished law school, and Donnie did significantly poor in school. Number 4. The killer lived nearby or visited often, knew Donna well, and was most likely a part of her everyday life. Someone such as a spouse, a partner, lover, a friend, a co-worker, a classmate, a date, or someone in a position to offer help 
basically a man she would let in despite the late hour. Of the five, Donnie lived the closest, only four blocks away, but despite a supposed secret relationship between the two, he would have known Donna the least. Nonetheless, he will be included. He who knew Donna the closest, the estranged husband John, who was said to have been stalking and harassing Donna at the time. Her boss and close friend David, who multiple witnesses claimed had a key to Donna's apartment, including the upstairs neighbor who had seen him come and go multiple times on his own. It was also well rumored that Donna had been having an affair with David. Next, Rod, whom Donna was dating, and also had given a key to the very morning of January the 12th. Rod often came over to the apartment around midnight to 1 a.m. when she was already in bed, and very well could have let himself in. Donna's ex-boyfriend, Terry Haynes, who was also said to have been stalking and harassing Donna at the time of her death. And even though Donna was said to be scared to death of Terry, she was one to open the door to him again and again. Again I shall bring up Donnie, whom it was said, whom it was said, had kept the key Donna had left for him in the mailbox, so he could deliver the couch. Though this key was never found in Donnie's possession, and Donnie adamantly claimed he had returned the key to the mailbox after delivering the couch back on Halloween. Number 5. A culprit who could have cleaned up someplace nearby. Anyone could have cleaned up using Donna's kitchen sink. But of the five, Donnie is the only one who was witnessed to have come home after possibly cleaning up in a gas station bathroom, where he had his car tire repaired. Number 6. It would have most likely been a sexually driven man who desired Donna, who sought sex or romance with her. Of the five, David Haynes is the only one most assumed would not arrive at Donna's for sex. But there was gossip of a secret affair, and it was said that he had a key to her apartment. So it is a tangible consideration. As far as Terry, indeed especially given he was drinking. John, most likely not for sex, but it is possible, but more likely to beg her back, which he was known to do very often, much like Terry, as remember he had stated, God will tell you, you belong to me. Rod for me stands out the boldest, seeing he was in the habit of arriving at her house at exactly the estimated time of her death, between midnight and 1 a.m., and whom had also sought to further things along with Donna, despite that pregnancy scare which had set Donna back emotionally. As for Donnie, while he was accused in court of having arrived at Donna's for sex and killing her upon rejection of him, according to jailhouse snitch Chris Chester, Donna stated that basically he was not her type, and despite the questionability of jailhouse snitches, the consideration must be considered. So all five scored here, but I would put an asterisk next to Rod's name, given the timeline. Number 7. Someone whom Donna would reject. Donna could have potentially rejected all five for the following reasons. A. David because he was not only her boss, but a married man. Though for absolute transparency, the marital infidelity on the part of the man had ever stopped Donna before. B. Donna was constantly rejecting Terry's advances, as she had grown afraid of him due to his borderline psychotic behavior and drug use. C. Donna was also constantly rejecting John, as despite what he may have felt or believed at the time, Donna had no interest in rekindling their marriage, and was eager to get the divorce finalized. D. This one is a bit more complex. You see, Rod was deeply in love with Donna, and there is little doubt that he desired her as a romantic partner, but also possibly as a wife and mother to any future children they may have. But after the pregnancy scare, and despite Donna getting on birth control, their sexual practices had changed a lot. This dynamic, given their potentially differing desires and needs, could have led to conflict, potentially explosive, seeing love and sex are two of the most potent and common motives for murder, especially given one has their hearts set on an envisioned future which might not be mutual, and there is a chance that things had finally came to a head. E. As for Donnie Bull, there is that secret relationship in Chris Chester, saying that Donna had wanted to break things off with him. Which of course, given Donnie's violent history with women, could have led to an explosive and unfortunate event. And again, all five meet the criteria. 8. The killer most likely would have been recently separated, divorced, or was experiencing marital discord. David was married, but his wife Sarah was rumored to be jealous of Donna and knew of their supposed affair. There is no telling how this had affected their marriage, but there is always the chance that David may have been motivated by fear of losing his marriage to Sarah, given he not get rid of his supposed mistress, Donna. Terry was recently divorced and having an on-again, off-again relationship with his ex, whom it was said to be well known he had physically abused. So Terry fits the criteria to a T. John, as we know, was undergoing a grueling divorce from Donna, 
which threatened his financial security a great deal, along with his general hope for the future. Rod was recently divorced, and though he was still financially supporting his children, he was left with a void in his life, possibly one he was trying to fill with Donna and any potential children they may have together. Donnie had experienced two divorces by this time, and had a consistent history of not only marital discord, but general discord, with women more often than the average person. Again, all five meet the criteria. 9. A Criminal Record Of the five, only Terry and Donnie have mentionable criminal records. Number 10. A temper and an assault of personality, but no experience with killing. To begin, none of the five were known to have previously killed anybody that we know of but only three were said to have had hot tempers, and a fourth who showed questionable signs worth mentioning. Terry was said to have physically abused his wife and struggled with both drug and alcohol abuse, which would inflame his temperament and throw his emotional state out of balance. John, according to Donna, had been verbally and emotionally abusive to her. That anger was becoming more physical by the day, which accumulated with his smashing a door with his fist beside her head and led to her decision to leave John and the marriage once and for all. Donnie, of course, as mentioned, had a criminal record. This record was composed of the violent assault of his sister-in-law in the early 1980s, in which he had been sentenced to prison for five years. Donnie was intoxicated and had lost his temper in an argument and beat and strangled this woman. He was also found guilty of assaulting a woman in March of 1993, two months after the double homicide, in which he claimed he had assaulted the woman in a bar parking lot when she attacked him. But the woman, however, had claimed that Donnie choked and sexually assaulted her in the back seat of her car in a desolate park late at night. Either way, this does not make a good look for Donnie, especially when considered a suspect in a murder case, which may have involved strangulation. And finally, that questionable behavior worth mentioning falls back on Rod, as according to Donna, he had been in sorts losing his patience with Justine. He felt that she was spoiled and whined too much, and insisted that Donna lay down more of a heavy-handed approach when it came to how strict her parenting style was, including making Justine go to bed earlier at night. And witnesses stated that parenting style, in fact, went from very little to quite extreme as a result of Rod. In this circumstance, the first three men garner a point. However, I shall give Rod a pass. 11. The killer most likely had a poor self-image. It is no secret that David thought very highly of himself, or so it appeared on the surface. Though his braggadocio nature could, in fact, have been a result of low self-esteem, however, it is not apparently factual enough to give him a point for this aspect. Harry, we could say, given his failed marriage, dependency on drugs and alcohol, and desperate need for Donna in his life, had an inadequate self-image. John, losing his wife and seeing his family fall apart, along with significant problems with his family, the farm business, and money in general, was at a point in his life when all seemed to be slipping through his grasp. Thus, a low self-image. Rod had found the girl of his dreams and was most likely feeling on top of the world, though he may have felt his invested future with Donna, due to the pregnancy scare, was now on shaky ground. Regardless, Rod will be allowed another pass here. As for Donnie, it was well claimed that Donnie felt that every girl in town wanted him, and he made no bones about making a pass on anyone he felt attracted to. Donnie was in good shape, stacked with muscle, and he was said to be a handsome man. And though he always made sure to clean up and dress nice, he did have a much lower intelligence than his peers, and he had failed at much in his life, including two marriages. He drank too much, he did drugs, and was more often than not broke. His mother had just died, who he had a close relationship with, and he was abused by his father severely as a child, constantly being put down by the man. And for this, I think it is safe to say Donnie most likely had a low self-image overall. Number 12. Problems with maintaining consistent employment and financial dependency. Donnie is the only suspect here who falls into this category, and does so nearly perfectly, as he was always jumping from one job to the next, always broke, and often dependent on women to support him. For this trait, Donnie stands alone. 13. Vocational skills and or growing up on a farm or experience with fire. Beginning with David, he outright claimed to have more knowledge of fire than most, and even went so far as to go into detail about his fireplace at a home he had decades back, which his friends loved to stop by and sit beside the fire while he stoked it. David also grew up on a farm. He was a Vietnam veteran, and though he went on to be a banker, he was most likely well-trained in vocational skills in the army. 
and it would be foolish not to add that David had discovered the fire at Donna's apartment and had made suspicious mentions about the blaze, including potentially setting off a booby trap and or kicking over a container of accelerant. Oddly enough, given his knowledge of fire and how it works, he pulled the air conditioner out of the window along with breaking the others. Along with this and his strange engagement with the fire and claims of the events surrounding his time amongst that fire, for this aspect, David certainly gains a point. Donnie was also said by his girlfriend at the time, Rochelle Hillmeyer, to be consistently gathering or raking up things in the yard to burn. As minimal and even typical as it might seem for any homeowner, renter, or occupant of a home with a yard, he too shall garner a point. 14. The killer would have probably changed jobs or residences or left town altogether. Not one of the five had left town. Only Donnie was known to have quit his job, but this was likely due to his March arrest for a separate case. Donnie and Rochelle also broke up at this time, and he had changed residences from his home he shared with her on South 2nd Avenue in Canton to the Fulton County Jail in Lewistown, but I'm not sure this relocation counts. For this aspect, no one gets a point. 15. The killer most likely coped with this crime by drinking heavily, resorting to drugs, and or chain smoking. Again, Terry was already a hard drinker and abuser of drugs, so it would be hard to tell. Same with Donnie, though Rochelle said he had been drinking more and more. This pattern had in fact begun before the killings. Rod admitted to having severe mental and emotional challenges after the event, but it is unknown if his drinking increased. The same goes for John and David. For this aspect, Donnie will receive a point, as his substance abuse had increased and was apparent by his more out of control behavior, which led to several allegations of misconduct along with his current imprisonment at the time for the separate case of assault. 16. Out of remorse, the killer could have had trouble sleeping or trouble performing within their sex life. This aspect is challenging to determine for any of the five suspects. However, it was known that Donnie often suffered from some sort of sexual intimacy, especially with women close to him, as was the case with Rochelle. She even stated that Donnie showed more affection to the family cat than he did to her. Rochelle also claimed that Donnie's sexual interest increased with his alcohol consumption, and it is possible he only felt comfortable with intimacy while under the influence, or with women with whom he had not had a close relationship. But this theory is not a certainty, and though it is known that all five men struggled with Donna's death, as she was adored by all, John and Rod had the most challenging time, emotionally and psychologically, and this absolutely could have led to sleep problems and more. But nothing of the like had been documented per se. So for this aspect, no suspect will receive a point. 17. Notable change of behavior in bars and the like. We know that at least one witness came forth to report to police statements about Donnie in a bar, telling her he was able to kill someone and get away with it. But this woman, who had been intoxicated at the time of giving her statement, later changed her story, stating that it was actually too loud in the bar to clearly hear exactly what Donnie had spoken to her that evening. There is also that event that happened with the woman who he had spent the night drinking with at several bars in which had ended him up with an eight-year prison sentence for assault. For this, it is debatable as to whether or not to give Donnie a point. But I will, because no other suspect's behavior at a bar or the like, all but one, had been reported after the murders. And that one other suspect would be David Haynes, who had not only been said by Iona Price to have been acting almost relieved that Donna was dead, while drinking at the Elks Lodge one night with other bankers from the National Bank of Canton who had stopped by to play cards and blow off some steam. David had also been accused of saying while in line at Kroger's grocery store that he was glad Donna was dead, and that they were having an affair, and that he knew how the fire started. So for this odd behavior, David will also receive a point. Number 18. The culprit began to miss work after the killings. Donnie had not only called in to work due to a hangover the morning of the fire, but his close friend and co-worker, Mike Price, had told police Donnie always seemed to miss work after things like this happened in town, meaning after he had been accused of misconduct by a female. 19. The killer would have increasingly become more of a loner or isolated. I cannot think of any suspect that this trait would apply to, but Donnie, who is said to be quiet and socially awkward, but the thing is, this had always been the case with Donnie, and it did not apply to this time frame alone. A co-worker of David's at the bank, Mr. App and his wife, had contacted police about an odd statement David had made at their home during a blackout that very winter, in which David and his family came over to keep warm with their kerosene heater. 
Miss App told officers that David had been unusually quiet that night, and that while she was into a long description of her views about the incident, she had said, why would someone put Donna and Justine together? And David, who had been holding his head down in silence all night, popped up and blurted out, to hide the evidence. This response startled Miss App, and she took a few seconds to regain her composure, and then she agreed with David. And David again became quiet and bowed his head. While this event does not suggest David had become more of a loner, it does imply, for the talker he had always been known to have been, in this circumstance he had a markedly changed state of behavior that included being less social and more introspective and withdrawn from those around him, and for this he will receive one point. While on the topic of the night of the blackout, now is a good time to note that that evening David had told Mr. App his own personal theory as to who killed Donna and Justine. He stated that he believed John's dad, Ron Tompkins, was somehow involved because he would save money over the years. But he said that ultimately he felt responsible because he had told Donna that the apartment was available. Also adding that the employees at the bank were getting really tired of the police trying to prove that there was any embezzlement going on. A statement also asterisk worthy, ladies and gentlemen. Number 20. Possible change of appearance and loss of weight. Again, for this aspect, all I can attribute is that, in particular, both John and Rod have been dealing with a heavy blow to their mental health, and thus could have struggled with weight loss. Now whether either had, or it would have been intentional, is not known, in addition to any change in length, style, or color to their hair, or any shaving of facial hair or growing a beard, as there is no evidence for such for not only these two, but any of the five. Zero points. Number 21. The killer would not have been the preppy type. This excludes David, but would include Terry, John, and Donnie. Number 22, the killer would have been naturally scruffy and unkept. This would also exclude David, but it would, on the surface, seem to include Donnie. But in fact, Donnie was said to care deeply about his appearance, and despite that head of shaggy hair, he was always clean in shape and dressed to impress the ladies. On the other hand, Terry had been known to sport a beard and long hair, and had a manner that could be described as more laid-back and natural. Number 23. The person responsible would have followed the investigation closely in the media, possibly interjecting themselves, calling the police, and asking not only them, but also others, many questions. David is the first that comes to mind here, as police had in fact felt David wanted to participate in the investigation, as he had made direct statements to them about wanting to do just that, help them out with the investigation. John had asked so many questions to police, including the condition of the bodies, that had grabbed the attention of investigators. Terry himself had thrust himself into the home of Rod's that very morning, not to seemingly ask questions, but to inform Rod in a very off-putting manner of the death of Donna, whom they had both dated. Terry told Rod that he had seen both her and Justine carried out on stretchers to an awaiting ambulance in the street. Now as mentioned, he arrived to make a statement, not ask questions according to his actions, but to barge into someone's home like that, in that manner without knocking, suggests he in fact was very inquisitive and confrontational as to if and what Rod may have known about the deaths. This later circumstance doesn't hold water as far as this particular aspect goes, but Donnie's compulsive watching of the news reports on television the day of the fire certainly does. However, it is important to mention that the fire and murders had occurred only a matter of blocks from Donnie's home, and most certainly, many Canton residents had been glued to their televisions that day in order to learn more details, of which their only other source of information would have been rumor and gossip. Nonetheless, Donnie will receive a point, as will David and John. Number 24. This type of killer could have easily passed a polygraph. Seeing Rod and Donnie both refused a polygraph, Terry Haynes was the only one whose test was flagged as suspicious, as he had made some answers concerning the deaths in the fire that could not clearly be determined as true or false. But this aspect is not about failing the test, it is about passing the test. And to my knowledge, John is the only one who had unquestionably passed the test. Terry had technically passed as well. He too will get the point. 25. The killer would have possibly experienced increased anxiety each time the anniversary of the killing rolled around. David is the only one to have expressed outright an increased amount of grief at this time of year, on this day, January 13. Number 26. The killer may have visited the gravesite of the victims. The only obvious answer to this trait is to state that John, David, and Rod were at the funeral. 
Rod said that he did not talk to the family, but stood back and avoided eye contact, as he was still bitter about Donna's father accusing him of trying to muddy the waters of the Amicucci bloodline. David, on the other hand, was a willing participant in the funeral, befriending the family and gaining the admiration of not only the father whom David claimed had stated he wondered how things would have turned out if he and Donna would have stayed together, but of Donna's brother, whom David claims blew him a kiss upon leaving the cemetery that day. John, however, stated at the end of Donnie's trial that he would now essentially be burdened by having to make the long trip all the way to Sterling to visit the graves of his wife and daughter if he wanted to visit them. But this is not comparable to David serving as Paul Bear. Essentially, how much closer to the gravesite can you get but to participate in the burial of your victims and once and for all, cover your misdeeds in six feet of soil? Though Rod's behavior could be considered suspicious, not showing up at the funeral would have been considered much shiftier given he was Donna's boyfriend at the time. Thus, for not only visiting the gravesite, but literally carrying Donnie and Justine to their graves, David will receive a point. And Rod, though his act of going to the gravesite was nothing more than to be expected, he was withdrawn, he was withdrawn, stood back, and avoided contact with her family entirely. Number 27. The man who committed these unthinkable acts would have asked for forgiveness. David was outwardly plagued with a level of grief for not pulling the two from the fire and has spoken of such to this day. Donnie Bull not only did not ask for forgiveness, not once until the time of his death, but instead defiantly proclaimed his innocence, even refusing a plea deal that would have saved him from the death sentence of which he would go on to receive. Number 28. Seeking Religion David was and is a man who proclaims his worship of Jesus and that if he should idealize anyone, it would be Jesus. This could be taken many ways, but what have you. Terry was a bit fanatical when it came to religion, but this behavior precluded the murders. But that is not to say it did not increase after that fatal day. John was a Christian, but one issue Donna had with him in their marriage was that he failed not only to share her passion for her spiritual faith, but also had practically zero interest in the topic when she would bring it up. Rod met Donna for the first time in church, during Mass in fact. He had sponsored her attendance at a Catholic retreat in which she attempted to heal from the wounds her failed marriage and the death of her mother had caused her. Religion was their common bond, and there is no doubt that Rod had leaned on his faith to get through those hard times, guilty or not. Donnie, on the other hand, spoke of the power of God in letters from jail and prison, but to my knowledge had never become a reborn as many inmates do. This is a tough category indeed. Part of me wants to give both Terry and Rod a point, but part of me feels that since his strong faith was pre-existing, it is beside the point. But there is one point to make here. Terry had leaned heavier and heavier into his Elks Lodge involvement over the following years, rising in rank. And this was, and is, a Christian organization. He also struggled through rehab again and again until he came out on the other end. How one would achieve what he had, freeing himself from that level of substance abuse and addiction, and stepping back from that verge of insanity as he had, without faith in a higher power, that would be hard to imagine. So considering religious constitution, I will give both Rod and Terry a point, and we shall see if that really makes a one-point difference in the end. Number 29. The killer may have been drinking at the time to gain courage, but could not have been drunk and still managed to attempt to cover up the crime scene in the fashion in which it had been done. The night of the killings, it is known that David did throw a party for his youngest son, who was turning one, and following that, he enjoyed a basketball game with his wife on television. But it is unknown if he had drank that evening. Terry was known to be a heavy drinker at the time and had gone to the American Legion that night to play cards, so he would have most likely had a few drinks. John also enjoyed the game on television, but seeing he had to work early on the farm the following morning, he most likely did not have a drink that night. Rod professed to drinking screwdrivers while hanging out in the kitchen listening to music and watching television with his brother Anthony and roommate Scott, and while on the phone with Donna around 11pm when she was also enjoying a schnapps and cider. Donnie had hosted a card game at Rochelle's that night, in which many beer runs had been made between 4 in the afternoon and midnight to 1am. It is well documented that Donnie had not only smoked a couple of joints that night, but also drank nearly two dozen beers, making him extremely intoxicated that evening and into the wee hours of the morning. And according to this theory, I would have considered Donnie way too hammered to have manipulated and managed the crime scene in the fashion that it had been done. 
Ladies and gentlemen, now is a good time to mention that large bottle of Canadian Miss Whiskey that Donna had bought on her way home from work that evening, along with the schnapps and cider. Though Rod loved whiskey, it is debatable who exactly this whiskey was for, as Donna rarely kept alcohol in the house. So this question remains, was the whiskey indeed for Rod? And had he gone over to enjoy a drink with her after getting off the phone that evening, as he usually did at that hour? Or had Donna possibly been expecting other company? If the whiskey was for Rod, but there were no plans for him to go over that evening, it would have been quite the price he purchased for Donna's budget to go out of her way to buy it on such a whim for no reason on a Tuesday night when she planned to be home all alone. This raises the question, who was she possibly expecting that night? And is this why she had turned on the porch light? Because as Rod had once mentioned, she never turned on the porch light. And in his memory, she had only once, when he had first come over late at night and parked his 1979 blue two-toned Nissan pickup truck in back of the house, out of sight, of both John and Terry. It must also be mentioned, no one at any local liquor store had recalled Donna coming in to buy the whiskey, which was not usually sold in such a large bottle as she had purchased it. But Donna had been witnessed stopping by the Elks after work for some cigarettes, some Salem lights. And though she chatted with the co-worker, Linda Pig, about her upcoming birthday party in just a week away, Donna stayed for only a few minutes, and in a hurry said on her way out the door, I have something to do. This led police to look into the size of Donna's purse, assuming it could have possibly been used to steal the whiskey from behind the bar. And I must ask again, ladies and gentlemen, had Donna planned on getting wasted out of her mind that night alone? And if so, why? And why such a large bottle for just her? And why on a Tuesday night, a work night? Unless she was working up the courage for some unimaginable action or event. The answer is most likely not. And that it was, in fact, either a gift or to share with someone else who might be stopping by her place that night. And if so, who? Rod had noted to police that during the same January 12th phone conversation with Donna, when she mentioned she had purchased the snobs and the bottle of Southern Comfort, she then stated that a guy had expressed interest in her at the bank that day. And when Rod asked what his name was, Donna only said, some guy whose ex-wife was dating John, and that she thought this was weird, and that she was not interested in the guy. But given how possessive Rod had become, asking Donna to devote herself only to him and to tell him if she was going to see someone else or had, how likely was it that Donna would have in fact been up front with Rod if this guy was going to come over for a drink at such a late hour, possibly to play a little game of tit for tat on their ex-spouses? Stranger things have happened, ladies and gentlemen. Now, we arrive at number 30. Despite the late era, 1993, the killer of Donna and Justine very well could have driven an old and unmaintained red or orange Volkswagen Beetle. Yes, that's right, the people's car, which is also the official car of the serial killer, made famous amongst the murderous kind by the one and only Ted Bundy. There are many reasons why a case such as this points to such a vehicle. There are many practical reasons, as they used to be cheap and plentiful at one time. In its heyday, the quintessential hippie car had around 423,000 drivers on the road. And that is the definition of anonymity, to hide in plain sight, is it not? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Donnie owned a red Volkswagen Bug. And given the waning of the era as I had mentioned, this car may have been a novelty to Donnie and to his friends. But it is important to mention that today, this Beetle would be the equivalent of a neutral colored sedan a beige Camry or Taurus well disappeared amongst a river of traffic on the road. And I'm the first to admit that this VW Bug absolutely puts the crosshairs right on the back of Donnie, as he was the sole suspect and he owned a Bug. But this Bug was not in condition to drive, as it had been in a constant state of disrepair, and it sat broke down in front of Rochelle's home at the time of the fire, to later be taken by one of his friends and parted out for cash. But before we railroad Donnie Bull, let's tally the score, shall we? From lowest to highest, here we go. Nine points, Rod Franciscovich. Eleven, John Tompkins. Runner up with 12 points, David Haynes. 
Second place with 14 points, Terry Haynes. And the winner is with 18 points, Donald Bull. Now, ladies and gentlemen, once again, before we begin to railroad Donnie Bull and possibly make the same mistake the task force had allowed Sergeant Ayers, we must remember to use deductive reasoning properly not only involves identifying the problem, gathering evidence, and formulating a hypothesis, but also deducting the possible issues with our hypothesis. We must also evaluate its strength and validity and search for any errors, gaps, or contradictions that may be found. To do this, we must again take a good look at the evidence. The one thing that immediately jumps out to me is the timeline. And the timeline is something that shall never be tossed out the window. So ladies and gentlemen, let's remember, while it is true that once we have eliminated all which is impossible and that which remains, however improbable, must be the truth, it is also true of its opposite, that that which has been deemed impossible however probable must not be the truth. Yes, the community, the friends, and families were hungry for the ever-elusive closure, but the biggest mistake investigators and we, ladies and gentlemen, can make is to let moral outrage substitute for evidence. And to quote Neil Peart, quick to judge, quick to anger, slow to understand. Ignorance and prejudice and fear walk hand in hand. I'm Corey Zimmerman, and this is Spoon River Gothic. Thirteen days into the new year, 1993, Canton, Illinois, in the heart of the Spoon River Valley. What remained of the holiday lights twinkled from ice-encrusted eaves. A bank trust officer named David Haynes had arrived early in the morning at his secretary's apartment in an old Victorian home to check on her, as she had yet to arrive for work with the ATM drop. David backed his mustard-yellow Toyota pickup into Donna's icy drive at about 9.15 a.m., Cleaning lady Cindy Nauss was putting her supplies away in her hatchback, and she watched the dark-haired, mustached man until she drove off as he climbed out of his truck. He then walked through the snow to the home south side facing porch, where he banged on the door, but there was no response. He ran around the house to the north side apartment and knocked on that neighbor's door to ask Pauline Newcomb, owner of the property, if he could use her phone to call the police, and that is when he heard a tapping on Donna's side of the wall. He panicked, ran back to Donna's side of the home, and pulled an air conditioner out of the kitchen window when two columns of smoke billowed into the windy sky. He then broke a window in Donna's front door and forced his way in, and amongst the smoke and crackling, that's when he saw it, the bright red dome of an inferno burning across the room, and the fierce heat pushed him back out of the house as he shouted her name, Donna, Donna. Engines from the Canton Fire Department rolled up in five minutes. Firefighters contained the blaze and made their way to the main bedroom. It had been completely scorched. The ceiling was black with soot and ash, and there was fear that the ceiling joist would collapse into the room any minute. On a shared sofa bed, investigators saw two bodies. The woman's body was lying down towards the end of the bed, beside a broken whiskey bottle. Her legs drawn up, but if she had been straight, her legs would have been off the bed. Her arms were close to her sides, and her hands were charred. The small girl was lying on her back, with the wooden chair covering her head and shoulders, just to the woman's left, and both were in the nude. Outside, David looked at the smoking home and told a cop, if Don and Justine are in that room, they are surely dead. A man named John Tompkins, who had been busy grinding feed on his father's farm, heard the grim news. 
there had been an accident, and the coroner had been called. John fainted to the ground, as he knew immediately his 30-year-old wife and 3-year-old daughter were both dead. Word quickly spread around the community that a tragedy had occurred in the heart of town, and that the friendly lady from the bank and the heartthrob of a waitress at the Elks. Spoon River Gothic is a production of Lone Bird Media in association with CZ Studio and Radio Verite. The show is produced by August Olson, editing, directing, and producing by Corey Zimmerman, audio mastering and engineering by E. Mastered. Research is done by Anne-Marie Cannon, Chelsea Mesa, and me, Jinra Illustrisimo. Spoon River Gothic is written and hosted by Corey Zimmerman. You can follow the show at czstudio.works and read the blog at spoonrivergothic.com. Show some love by leaving us a rating or review on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And stay tuned for the next episode as we dive deeper into the Donald Bull case. Thank you for listening. This is Spoon River Gothic, narrative of a double homicide.